please turn with me this evening to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Matthew 4, verse 1. My friends, my subject this evening is uh, people left undisturbed by the devil, people left unperturbed by the evil one. And we're looking and drawing our lessons from this passage uh, in Matthew 4, the account of the temptation of Jesus Christ. How the devil tempted him or sought uh, to trip him up. How the devil attempted three times to try and make Christ sin, to lure Christ into sinning. Uh, he uses subtlety, he uses craftiness, he uses even scripture to try and make Christ fall. But he couldn't. He couldn't triumph over Christ. Christ, on each occasion, triumphed over him. Why did he triumph? Well, because there was nothing in Christ. When the devil came and dangled those temptations before Christ, Christ, yes, he felt the temptations. He was a man. He felt it like we would feel it. He didn't uh, use his deity in that sense to feel, uh, to be unfeeling in the matter. He really felt the temptations when they came his way. But because there was nothing in Christ that the devil could latch hold on, so he was able to resist these temptations. Different with us. With us, there are things in us. Temptation can come from without. Temptation can come from within, both ways. But why does temptation have so much success with us? Why is it that we seem to fall so often into sin? And we're not, when we talk about temptation, we're not talking about those trivial things that we talk about sometimes, you know, the temptation to eat a piece of chocolate cake or to turn over in bed for another hour or the temptation to, you know, phone in at work and say, I'm, I'm sick. Well, that's not a small thing, but you know, that's a lie. But these are, considered, these are considered somewhat trivial compared to what we're thinking about tonight. The temptation to sin. Why do we yield to the terrible sins? Well, because we have a sinful nature. There's something in us that is attracted to that temptation. That wants those things that are dangled before us. And so we so easily and sadly capitulate to it. Not so with Christ. But here we're, we're talking uh, tonight really about these temptations, and I'm afraid, I'm sorry, that we have to talk a little bit more about the evil one tonight, but we have to mention some of the antics that he gets up to and the ways that he tries to deceive people. He tried it with Christ, he tries it uh, with believers, and he tries it even with the unbeliever but not, as you will see, as much with them. He's an evil being, the devil. He's a hater of all that is good. He's a hater especially of God. He dislikes God intensely, immensely. He's a hater of men and women because you and I are created in the image of God. We're God's image bearers. And he doesn't like it when he sees you know, that image of God still remaining, greatly blurred, greatly marred, in our fallen natures and our fallen be as fallen beings, but still he hates it. The Bible describes him as a liar and a murderer and a tempter, among other things. The enemy of God, the enemy of souls, and of all who serve Christ especially. He bears no love for man. He bears no love for you. He's not interested in your well-being. He not, doesn't care. He doesn't ask you, how are you today? How are you doing in sincerity? He's not interested in that kind of uh, uh, interest in you. He's not like Christ. He's against you. He, he wills to take all men, as many as he can, all men and women with him to hell. That's what his intention is. That's what he's after. There's nothing in him that is uh, good. And so... Uh, he's out to tempt men, uh, especially the believer, Christ. He cannot tempt him anymore. Of course, he's in glory. He's at the right hand of the Father. So he's out to get as close to 
tempting them, tempting Christ by tempting his people. But there is a group of people he doesn't really tempt so much. There is a group of people in this world who really he tends to leave them alone. He doesn't leave them alone entirely and completely, but he does, he, he does, uh, he does to a certain degree. He dis doesn't disturb them or trouble them or annoy them or tempt them as much as he does uh, believers. His attacks are primarily focused on the believers. The unbeliever, well, he generally leaves that person alone. Yeah, the unbeliever, well, I, I have you where, where I want you, he's saying, in a state of unbelief. And that's where I'm determined to keep you, to keep you from Christ. And that will be my attempt all the days of your life to keep you uh, from uh, going to him, from coming to him. So this is what we're thinking of, friends, uh, in these three uh, temptations of Christ. Well, let's look at them uh, individually and briefly. The first temptation we have here in verse uh, 2 and 3, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, Christ was afterwards and hungered. He was extremely hungry. Uh, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now Christ, as you read here, hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. It was all a part of his preparation for the ministry that he was about to enter into. At the end of these 40 days, he was extremely hungry, as you can well imagine as a person. Well, the devil can't, comes to him and says to him, not if really, in our text it says if, it really should be since you are the Son of God, as you are the Son of God, command these stones that they be turned, be made a bread. Well, in effect, his saying is, don't wait for God to work. Don't wait for God to provide for you. Take matters in your own hands. You're able to do these things. You are the Son of God. You are divine. You have the power to do miracles. Turn, use that power to turn stones into bread. You have this inherent power. You don't need to trust God anymore. Leave off trusting in Him and wait for Him. Don't, you don't need to wait for Him. Take matters in your own hand. Deliver yourself out of this temptation and out of this predicament that you're in. It's a temptation, this first one, friends, not to depend on God, but to depend on himself. That's what this first temptation is all about. That's what behind, what's behind uh, Satan's suggestion here. Use your power. Don't depend anymore on God. Don't lean upon him. Do uh, use your, live within your own power. Depend on yourself. Well, verse 4, the Lord answered and said, uh, from the scriptures, from Deuteronomy, this is, man shall not, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Life is more than food. Yes, man needs bread. He needs food for the body. He needs that to sustain uh, his, his earthly life, his physical life. But he also needs food for the soul. He needs the word of God to live. It's not just about eating food, it's also about obtaining spiritual food for the soul. Man is not just a physical being, he's not just a material substance, uh, he's not just an, an earthly thing, he's not just a body. Man is also a soul. Man, God has created man with a body and a soul. There's a spiritual side uh, to man. And this is how God uh, has made us, just like a car. You have a car, but well, the car is not just its body work. The car is, has also, underneath its bonnet, it has an engine. Of course it does. Without it, well, it won't go very far at all. So also, a man has, not, uh, has a body and a soul. The main part is the soul. That's what keeps it going. That's the life of the, the man, the woman, the soul. Now, the believer, he also lives in dependence on God. He lives a life trusting in the Lord. 
He doesn't trust in himself. He doesn't trust in his own powers. He trusts in God. And he trusts in God to lead him. He trusts in God to guide him through life. He trusts in God to provide for him. When he has great trouble, he looks up to God. He prays to God. And he asks the Lord for help. He's living every day in dependence upon God. He doesn't take God for granted. He prays even, Lord, give me my daily bread. I depend on you. He looks up to the Lord for his everyday needs. He asks God for help when he's brought into great difficulties and uh, predicaments and he doesn't know which way to turn. He looks up and says, Lord, I don't know what's happening to me, but I trust in your name. I depend on you. This is how he lives. I know that you are good. I know that you are all wise. I know whatever you allow to happen to me comes from your hand. He, t he takes it in this way. He sees life in this way, a life of living in dependence upon God and on, on Christ, and especially for salvation. For salvation. Before he, before he came to know the Lord, well, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't like this, depending on God. He depended on himself. He was full of self-confidence before he came to the Lord. But there came a day when he realized, well, God is real. God is, God is present in this world, and I need to know him. God is holy, and I am a sinner. He came to realize that. And there was that day when he felt a deep need in his soul, a deep need within him, the need for forgiveness, the deep need in his soul for a savior and for a, a touch from the Lord to change him and to bring him, to reconcile him to God. He felt the need for Christ. And he turned to him and he came and he said, Lord, I trust in you. I trust in you to save my soul. I put my trust in you. I depend, I lean upon you entirely for salvation. Save me, Lord. And the Lord heard his prayer. And since then, he's been living in dependence upon God. And he's found it a blessing and a joy to do that, uh, to live in such a way. Which is why, why the devil comes along and tries to tempt him, just as he tempted Christ here, to leave off trusting in God. Oh, don't live in this way. Live for yourself. Depend on yourself. You have power. You have abilities. You don't need to pray about everything. You don't need to trust God in everything. Oh, friends, this, was, this is how the devil tempts the believer. But this is a temptation the unbeliever doesn't really know. Because he is not depending and leaning on Christ. He is depending on himself. He is not, not trusting in the Lord. Perhaps he does not even believe in God. So he hardly ever prays to God unless he's in great trouble. Unless he's in a, uh, such a state where he really is, sees no way out and he's desperate. Then he'll say a prayer to God. Oh Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. I'll do this and this if you save me from this situation. Lord hears and answers, but then after that, he goes back to living as he, as he did. And he hardly ever prays again. He depends on himself. I am able, he says. I can handle things in my own power. I believe in myself. That's what he's saying. That's what uh, these kind of people are saying. I can manage without God. I don't need Christ. Well, that's music to Satan's ears, friends, to think like that, to feel like that. So what, he, what does he do? He leaves these kind of people alone. He doesn't trouble them. He's got you exactly where he wants you. He doesn't want you, to, he won't disturb your peace. He won't come causing uh, trouble to your soul. Is this you, friend? Is this you? You're living in this kind of a way, half Perhaps only half a life, only living uh, for the body, the material things, and there's no spiritual side for, to you, no dependence on God. But then the second temptation here in verses 5 and 6, and it's along these lines. It doesn't matter what you do, it will be all right in the end. It doesn't matter how you act, it doesn't matter how you live, the devil says, 
it's going to be fine in the end. Everything's going to turn out well. Well, look, let's look at it. The devil took him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And some people will think that this is a literal event that happened, that the devil really did take him or lead him uh, to the, the temple. Others think it's a vision, but uh, maybe it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a bit divided either way, but it could really have happened. If he was taken, some people say he was taken to the northeast corner of the temple, and there there would be a drop of some 400 to 450 feet, and it was by the Kidron Valley. So that would be a great uh, drop. Others uh, say, no, this is at the public corner of the, of the temple. And uh, Christ, if he threw himself from that public corner, well, he would fall into the, the main court of the temple, the very public place. And what a great miracle that would be uh, if he did that and he landed without any hurt and harm. Well, the Lord in response, as we read, quotes from the scriptures, Deuteronomy again, and, uh, and uh, says, uh, he shall, oh, sorry, the devil quotes from Psalm 91 uh, here. He's using a scripture to try and uh, tempt the Lord. Throw yourself down, he says, uh, from this high point. God will, by his angels, keep you from harm and injury. Again, not if, but you are the son of God. Since you are the son of God, God cares so much for you. God won't allow any harm to come to you. Throw yourself down. He'll protect you. Uh, just think how impressive it will be if you throw yourself off this pinnacle and you land safe and sound in the middle of the, the temple and uh, everyone who sees it will be amazed. It's greater than a miracle. Everyone will believe straight away. This is, uh, this is what he's saying. Everyone will believe in you. But he wouldn't have gone to the cross then. He wouldn't have gone all that way to Calvary if he'd done this. The Lord, in response, said, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. I must live, in effect, he's saying, by the Scriptures. I must live by the Word of God. I cannot act in this presumptuous way, as you suggest. To jump off the pinnacle and to expect that God would care for me, well, I don't have a uh, permission from God to do such a thing. I don't have his authority to do such a thing. To do such a thing would be an act of presumption on my part. I have no mandate from God to jump over this cliff. I live by the word of God. And that's how I must live my life. Very careful attention to the word of God. I cannot live in this careless manner. And the believer thinks in the same way. The believer, when he is concerned to please the Lord, he's concerned to please Christ. He loves the Lord. He loves him and wants to please him from his heart. He wants to do his will. He's careful about how he lives his life. He doesn't want to offend his Savior. He doesn't want to offend his God. He wants to do as he says because he loves him, because God has done so much for him. He wants to follow his word. He's yielded his life over to Jesus Christ. And so he walks in a conscientious manner. The word of God and the, the, the instructions of Christ matter to him. He's not going to live carelessly. He's not going to live anyhow. He's going to live carefully. He has much, much to rejoice in in life. Many pleasures that he can enjoy but he's also going to abstain from sin. He's not going to indulge in sinful things because he knows that displeases God. And there are consequences uh, to uh, sin. So he doesn't presume, he doesn't say, oh, God is merciful, God is good, I can live as I like and still get away with it. It's okay because God is so good. He doesn't think like that. But that's what the devil is suggesting to Christ here. 
Live as you like. Jump off. Doesn't matter. God will take care of you. He won't punish you. This is what he said, isn't it, to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Has God said, you will die? You will not surely die. Go on, take the fruit. No consequences to disobeying God. And they, she believed him. And we know what happened. Oh, well, friends, he attacks the believer in a similar way. Uh, uh, this is how he attacks the bit to draw him off uh, from this life, this careful, conscientious life to please uh, the, uh, his God. But the unbeliever, well, he leaves him undisturbed because that's not the unbeliever's priority in life to please God. He's living carelessly. He makes no attempt to please the Lord. He makes no attempt really to keep the word of God. His lust drive him in one direction, and he says, yes, I will go, I will follow, I will do, I'm not going to restrain myself, I'm not going to hold myself back, unless it's going to bring some shame to me publicly, oh, if I can do it and get away with it, yeah, I'm going to do it. That's the idea, isn't it? That's the mentality. He does as he wills. He's not really concerned about the consequences. Or that the Bible says, at the end of time, we are all going to be brought before God on the day of judgment, and we will be judged according to our works, according to how we have lived our life, according to what we have done, whether we have believed in the Lord and followed Him or not, or rejected Him. We don't think like that. We think, well, uh, I can do as I like, and at the end of time, I have still, God will be good. God will forgive. I was talking to a man only yesterday, and he was thinking, we were talking about forgiveness and uh, the need for forgiveness. And I asked him, he was a Muslim man, and I asked him, well, how, uh, how do you know God has forgiven you? He said, well, I just asked God to forgive me, and he forgives me. I, I know he forgives me. Well, how do you know? <laughs> he didn't really have a, any basis or foundation for forgiveness. But uh, we have the cross, isn't it? The cross is our basis. We know that the God forgives us uh, because of what Christ has done, that atoning work of Jesus Christ. Well, friends, people in this group were rather like criminals. Uh, criminal, you know, he thinks, I can rob the bank. I can uh, do this, uh, this great crime, and I can still get away with it. He always thinks he can get away with it, and he gets caught. Nine times out of ten, he gets caught. Friends, if we believe in God, uh, then the devil will uh, try and make us, uh, tempt us uh, to uh, live as we like. But if we are not living for the Lord and living for ourselves, well, then he will leave us uh, and he won't tempt us. He's happy that we are in that position. He'll leave us in peace. Again, I ask, is that you? Is that you, friends? Well, thirdly, uh, the final temptation in verses 8 to 10, a very straightforward one. Uh, the temptation is to leave off the worship of God. Verse uh, 8, Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. This must have been a vision. It would probably be quite difficult for him to show all the kingdoms, uh, literally. It must have been a vision. Verse 9, the, Lord said, or the devil said, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. This is audacious. Worship me, says the devil. Worship me on equal terms with the Father. Bow down before me, and I will reward you with all the kingdoms of the world. The Lord's answer, verse 10, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou, thou serve. So this was a direct temptation, no subtlety here. This is what Satan wants. He wants Christ to worship him. He wants to draw Christ off from worship. Well, this is how he tempts believers too. The believer believes in the Lord. His faith is in Christ. He trusts in God with all his heart. And primarily, he's a worshipper of the living God. He loves God. He adores God. 
He sees that God as the best of all beings. He sees God as wonderful. He knows that there is no one to compare with the Lord, that he, God is perfect in all his ways. You look at all his attributes, his faithfulness, his power, his goodness, his holiness, his gentleness. He's perfect in all those attributes of his. He's sovereign over all things. He recognizes that the Lord is his creator. So he, he humbles himself before him. He recognizes that the Lord is his savior, that God sent his only begotten son into the world to die on that cross in great agony so that the penalty of sin for all those who trust in him could be paid. And that's what Christ was doing on the cross. And he sees that. This is what God has done. What love, what amazing love uh, from God. And he falls down and he worships him. It's not just an external thing, friends. It's from the heart. He's, uh, he's enamored, can we say, with God. He loves God. He adores God. This is worship. He worships in spirit and in truth. He is grateful uh, f to God and uh, he praises him. Oh, the devil is envious about this. The devil hates this. When people worship God and extol God's name, he's envious, he's jealous about it. And he attempts uh, to uh, get the believer to abandon the worshiping of God. Worship something else, anything else but God. However, the person who doesn't worship God Oh, the devil doesn't bother with such a person. Let him be. He's happy again to leave that person in, in, uh, in peace. You know, we all worship something. All of us are built, are wired to worship. It's all a part of our human way, uh, makeup uh, to worship. If we're not worshippers then of the living God, we must be worshippers of something else. Something else is our God. If, God. if Christ is not our God, then he kneel before the idol, the God of gold and material things. Some make an idol of their favorite football player. You see this even from the stadium. They're, they're kowtowing, they're bowing down to the, the, their favorite football player when he scores a goal. Others of a famous actor or some, a famous star. Pleasure is another idol very common in our day. Biggest idol of all is self. Self idolatry. Everything is about me. The person I love the most is not God, it's me. I love myself the most. And so everyone must know about me and I must talk about myself and I must make myself known on Twitter every 20 minutes, tell people what I'm doing. And I must make, put, uh, upload photos of myself and I must increase my friends on Facebook and so on, social media. I must have my way in life. Me, is that the important thing? That's the important thing for me. My way. You know that song? I hope you don't know it, maybe. <laughs> but you know the song, My Way? And uh, apparently it's the most, one of the most popular songs uh, at funerals. Nowadays, you know, funerals of the modern day funeral, they have these songs, um, uh, pop songs and so on. And uh, one of the most popular is, I did it my way. I did it my way. What is that, friends? But self idolatry, isn't it? The worshiping of self. I didn't do it God's way. I did it my way. Is this you, friends? Is this you? Well, the devil won't waste time tempting you if this is your position. Oh, friends, I'm, I'm uh, half sorry to have to address you in this manner tonight. But uh, they have to tell you about these invisible and evil forces that are at work, whose only object is to keep you from Christ. As long as you keep your distance from Christ, as long as you don't take seriously the gospel, as long as you think of it as a light thing and that you can forget about it, you know that as soon as you go out of here, something else will crop up. Something else will crop up and you'll forget this message. And you forget this word, and you'll go out, be in one ear and out the other. The devil has stolen it from you. That's how active he is. That's what the Lord said. 
Friends, it's a battle for your soul. You must turn to the Lord while he is drawing you. Come, humble yourself before him. Repent before him. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all his heart. And he will bless you. He will bless you with forgiveness. He will bless you with spiritual life and quickening. He will bless you with joy unspeakable. He will bless you with answers to prayer. He will bless you with guidance in your life and strength in difficult times. He will be there with you and will take you at last to heaven. That's the blessing. But the devil will keep you from these blessings. The devil will do his very best to make sure you don't enjoy these blessings, that you're kept out of, of heaven and brought at last to hell. That's his intention. The ball is in your court, friends. Blessing is offered to you. What will you do? What will you do? Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Don't reject him. Re receive him. Yield yourself to him. Ask him to, for forgiveness. Ask him for life. And he will hear your prayer. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for uh, your warnings that you give to us and making us aware of those things even, those forces that would seek to take us and keep us from you and from Christ. Oh Lord, may they be ineffective. Come and help us, we pray in ourselves. We are weak, oh Lord, and we need an intervention from above. We need you, Lord, to come and to save our souls and to deliver us from all those temptations that would draw us in a different direction to you. Draw us, we pray, with the cords of a man. Draw us with love and help us to come in repentance and faith, trusting only in the blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in his precious name. Amen. Let's uh, close by singing our final hymn, number 300.